Oh, and I'm going to put on live transcripts. Uh, is it on? Yep, it is on. All right. Hello, everybody. I am Paula Ludwig with the Atlantic Institute. I am one of the event planners that we have. Uh, the Atlantic Institute is a, an organization that promotes dialogue between different faiths, cultures, religions, just getting to know your next door neighbor. And we hope with more conversations, we have less conflict. Um, we are going to watch a two minute video about the Atlantic Institute. This will also get any of those people who are having troubles getting in a little bit more time to get in. So I'm gonna show you that now. Um, I always press the wrong button. Share, share sounds. That was not the right one. Stop share. <laughs> I apologize. Where is my, oh, there we go. Share. And The Atlantic Institute is a nonprofit organization dedicated to promoting harmonious coexistence between peoples of various cultures, faiths, and backgrounds. We seek this goal through peaceful dialogue, education initiatives, and community organization. Our dialogue events bring together experts, community and faith leaders, and knowledge seekers to address social issues that affect us all. We feel dialogue is the most important element in peaceful coexistence, so we try and maintain several panel discussions, TED Talk events, and book clubs throughout the year. These events touch on social issues, race relations, and cultural understanding and are a mainstay of our programming. The Atlantic Institute's education events are extremely important to our mission of understanding. We want to promote socially forward critical thinking to students of all ages. To that end, we have developed programs that seek to grow the creative spirit of students and help them think about their communities and the world around them. Our Future Leaders of Dialogue event brings together nominated elite students to learn from each other as well as political and business leaders. Our Art and Essay contest gives students a theme about important societal issues and allows them to create wonderful works of art and writing while steering their minds towards improving their world. We are always seeking ways to educate youths and adults in order to make a peaceful world for all of us. Our community events are designed to transform neighbors into friends and groups of people into a community. By associating with other nonprofits or by our own initiative, we are always trying to discover new avenues to improve our neighborhoods, places of worship, and community centers. We host cooking demonstrations of food from other cultures, work with various nonprofits to help elevate the work of others, and try to find a way to make the lives of those who are disenfranchised or marginalized better. Building a more peaceful world starts in our backyards, so we are dedicated to improving our communities and associations. The Atlantic Institute is always seeking like-minded volunteers and collaborators. If you would like to learn more, find volunteer opportunities, or just want to chat with our staff, please visit our website at www.atlanticinstitutesc.org or follow us on Facebook. We will never run out of fun, educational, peaceful events. So come join us to help make this world a better place full of understanding and unity. All right. We had a somebody in the chat. Oh, they're just more people saying where they're from. All right, awesome. So we are gonna watch the video now. And like I said, I don't think it is very long. Got that one. All right. Sorry. Oops. All right, here we go. Sorry, get a watch the commercial. Doctor? Make it a reality at the number one provider of new doctors to the US. Dear Gwich, Bowney, my name is Elizabeth. 
I'm 18 years old and I'm a second year university student in Dublin. And I would like to share a glimpse into my beginnings. Prior to my birth, my mother, who was born in a Muslim family, converted to Christianity. And she faced persecution from her family, who were all Muslims at the time, and fled Nigeria to escape religious persecution and to fight for a better life for my four siblings and I, of which I am the youngest. She tried to get asylum in a number of countries and eventually got a letter of acceptance from a relatively small country known as Ireland. Ireland accepted her application. And while her case was pending, we were giving housing in a small town in the west of Ireland called Clifton, in one of the country's direct provision centers. And so began the wait for my arrival. My due date was July 13th, which was also the day that my father was born. But I refused and decided that I preferred to be born on the 16th. And so I was born in my mother's room with the umbilical cord wrapped around my neck. I was actually believed to be the first child to be born in Clifton, as opposed to in the hospital in 15 years. I even read the local news. I guess persistence and stubbornness pays off. And my mom still has a newspaper that detailed my rival story till this day. So you could say I had a rocky start to life other than the fact that I was born on the floor. I was literally born into a system that has been criticized by human rights organizations as illegal, inhumane, and degrading. But I've denied my beginnings the ability to dictate my end. After I was born, my siblings were granted residence here, and it was a relief for her to have all of her children with her. But what she didn't have was her husband, my father, her biggest support in the journey. And now after 18 years, multiple rejected visa applications, countless trips to the immigration offices and hundreds of, dip of visits to various different lawyers and solicitors, my father has yet to be granted access to join his family here. And growing up without him has been the hardest part. So the topic of this talk today is the need for family reunification and the effects of one parent households on children. We often spend time talking about how children are the future and how it's necessary and crucial for us to lay good foundations for them so they have equal opportunities to succeed. But the first and most important foundations in a child's life are laid at home within the family structure. And think about it. When you have two parents who want to be in your life, having both parents around and involved means having access to more of the economic and community resources available as both parents are willing to invest their time, energy, and money into the well-being of their children. And so I often imagine how different life would be if my father was here. If my father was here, I would have never had to witness my mother painstakingly try her best to raise my two sisters and I along with my two brothers alone. There is not one day I have not heard her beg God for the strength to raise us. Her earnest prayers have been the backdrop of my sleep and my only lullaby for as long as I can remember. She's only one person, so she needed his strength to be in five places at once as my siblings and I all had our different issues and problems to deal with that we needed her there for. But all the while struggling to maintain a good relationship with my father who is thousands of miles away. or what it would have meant to see my father at my recitals or at my brother's matches. None of us would have ever been left staring into a crowd of parents, disappointed that our own parents, our biggest supporters, couldn't be there. And I'm certain we would have escaped experiencing homelessness if my father was here. For months, 
My family and I were homeless. Finding housing in Ireland is difficult enough already, but just imagine how challenging it is for a single mother trying desperately to provide for her five children. In fact, at times it's virtually impossible, which is how my family and I ended up homeless. And I remember the first night we spent at the emergency accommodation hostel. My mother, siblings, and I all gathered to pray because we knew that the only thing we had left to depend on was God and his mercy. It was a tear-filled night, and we had many more of those in the following seven months of our homelessness. And I could give you all of the statistics about family separation around the world, or the harm it does children when they have parents who want to be together raising them, but are denied the chance to do so. But we don't need statistics or case studies to justify the need for family reunification. Because the idea that families should be together, deserve to be together, is a fundamental human right. It doesn't arise from research evidence or government charts. The right to be with your family, to be loved and cared for by your family exists because you exist. It is the right of all humans. And according to the United Nations Convention of the Rights of the Child, Article 9 states that children must not be separated from their parents against their will, unless it is in their best interest. And children whose parents are separated have the right to stay in contact with them, unless this would cause them harm. And we don't have to document that harm to show its magnitude and for those rights to be vital and central and urgent even though, of course, those harms are indeed very real. I remember a time when I was about seven years old and I had been tucked into bed by my mom. And I had a sudden realization that I couldn't remember what my father even looked like anymore. I began to cry to her as it felt like the waves of time had wiped away his image from my mind. My memories of him consisted of pictures and her stories of him for the longest time. Oh no. Sorry, hang on just a second. Let's see if we can get this to reload. And I had a sudden realization that I couldn't remember what my father even looked like anymore. I began to cry to her as it felt like the waves of time had wiped away his image from my mind. My memories of him consisted of pictures and her stories of him for the longest time. And now that my siblings and I are all grown up, I hear him lamenting to my mother over the phone about just how much he's missed out on. It deeply pains him that he doesn't know life with his daughters as women and his sons as men. And each day my yearnings grow stronger to enjoy life with him now that he is getting older and for him to enjoy the fruits of his labor. He was never given the chance to hold my hand as I took my first steps. But I pray I get the chance to hold his when he needs my help to walk in his old age. As many of you already know, the issue of family reunification is more than just an Irish issue. It's indeed a global issue, and it has been highlighted by the recent takeover in Afghanistan and the 
ongoing Israeli-Palestinian conflict. The sheer amount of families who've been displaced and the thousands of unaccompanied children arriving on the shores of countries all over the world, Ireland included. If there are parents who want to be together raising their children, no government should ever stand in their way, but should instead find ways to reunite families who've been broken up by war, persecution, immigration, and all sorts, but still have a desire to be together. We need governments to take into account the stories of young people like myself, whose families have been needlessly separated. By expanding safe and legal pathways for families to migrate together, whether that be migrant workers and their children or refugees, families have a greater chance of staying unified. We need governments to accelerate reunification applications. And we need them to address the bureaucratic and political barriers to reunification for families all over the world. My father is a gentle, loving man and the role model I have always needed. He is a man of great integrity and a passionate, loyal advocate for the welfare of his family. His love doesn't announce itself when it enters into a room. It's a quiet type of love, but it knows no bounds for his family. So, I cannot possibly begin to express how devastating it would be to continue living life this way, especially when I know that my father loves me and wants to be in my life. I want my father to join me here in Ireland, the country that my family and I are proud to call home. And I want all families to be made whole, to be reunified, to be together, as is our right. Thank you. All right, that was awesome. I am now going to turn this over to our moderator for the night, Cheryl Soul. Cheryl, it's all yours. Okay, can you hear me? Am I speaking loud enough? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Okay, good. Because I have one of those voices that tends to um, kind of trail off if I'm not careful. I have to remind myself to speak up. Um, and I also have a neurological condition that makes my voice sometimes fade. So if you can't hear me, just you know, give me a nudge and I'll try to speak up better. Um, just a little bit about me. I've been involved with Atlantic Institute for quite a long time, Paula. I don't really remember when I began the relationship, but it, I, I love to do these um, events and to um, meet different people. Um, it's, it's really been a blessing to, to me to be involved. Um, I'm retired from the University of South Carolina. I worked in student affairs. Um, the last position that I held at the university was the um, coordinator for um, interfaith initiatives. And that meant that I uh, worked with students who, <clears throat> who wanted to do interfaith work. And also um, I worked with the, our registered religious workers or, you know, which are basically chaplains. Um, met with them, registered them, uh, supported them. Um, I also worked um, providing funds from a, a very generous donor who gave money to allow students to have uh, faith-based service opportunities. So that's kind of what I did at work. Um, in my volunteer life, I was a longtime volunteer with Sister Care, which is the local battered women's agency. Um, and I was also a volunteer guardian ad litem for over 20 years. Um, and so that's 
part of my interest in talking about family separation comes from the background that I have in working with children who were in foster care. So that's just a bit about me. Um, okay, discussion about this topic of family separation. Um, just to throw it out there, what kind of impacts do you think, you know, based on what this young woman has said and what you may know yourself from your own experience, what kind of impacts could um, family separation have on immigrants, both parents and children um, and, the, and the broader families? What do you think? Anyone? Oh, come on, I, I know you must have some opinions about this. Do you think that, is everybody unmuted so that you can speak? No, they're not unmuted. I was gonna say, everybody can unmute and uh, join the discussion. Yeah, please do unmute yourself so that you can speak. There we go. Okay. And Cheryl, I tried sharing those articles and it won't let me, but I can email everybody these articles that have attended, so. Okay, okay. Well, I, I'll see if I can paste them in the chat and maybe that. Yeah, it won't let me for some reason. I've tried doing it different ways and it won't let me paste them in. Um, so it's acting like I have nothing there to paste. <laughs> huh, well, let me try. and. We'll see if we can do that. Okay, um, who's got an opinion about what family separation does to, to, to immigrant families in particular? I can talk a little bit about I that. Have, I have a question before, um, you, before somebody asks that question, if you don't mind. Sure, go ahead. Okay. My name is Dorcas and I'm in uh, Greenville. And uh, my concern is, is that in the beginning, she talked about her mother and saying that her mother uh, was Muslim, I guess while they were in Africa and then her mom converted to Christianity. That's sort of, that's sort of unusual because there's more about Christianity in Islam than it is in the Bible. I find that very strange that she said that. So I want that, that yeah, that, that doesn't make sense to me. So that was the first, my first concern. Well, is, is that because you don't think <clears throat> that, that sort of dim, uh, discrimination is common or because? Um... No, no, it's not discrimination. As a Muslim, she's already Christian. So why would she convert to a religion that she already is? That's what I'm saying. That, that doesn't make sense. I think that's a, probably a topic for another for Well, another yeah, but <laughs> we could go in for hours about that. Yeah, well, she brought it up and that that was that's why I'm like, what? So, yeah. Mm. Okay, anybody else have thoughts about um, the long-term consequences of separating a family like that? I mean, certainly it would be uh, Go ahead. It it would be very emotional. I mean, for emotional, uh, you know, to lose a parent, that's got to weigh on the child as far as emotional. Sure. But what, what about other impacts like economic impact? What that they lose means? the poor. Okay, I, okay. I, this, <laughs> I, maybe I'm probably gonna have to get off because I know I'm gonna make you all mad. So, <laughs> so man, Oh, man. So, you know, there was this thing called slavery, right? Where children yes. were sold, sold and what, you know, I mean, I feel sorry for the child. I mean, for her as a child. But Lord have mercy, you're talking 400 years of children being taken away from their parents and sold, you know, yeah. never to see their parents again. I'm sorry for her. But, you know, you got to look at the big picture. So I, I don't know if this is a conversation I need to be in because I think I'm, I get, I may, I may, I'm already upset and I don't want to, 
I don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm sorry for her and I am sorry for the children around the world, but things have to be made right, you know, and, and things are not, they're not made right. I'm, I'm sorry for her, but. Mm. That, that's another discussion we <laughs> yeah, have that's for what I said. several hours. I, yeah, some this of the will not articles, be for me tonight. Yeah, mm. Some of the articles that Paula is going to send mm. me um, were in quite, in fact, quite a few of them were related to slavery and family separation during slavery, which is a huge topic, um, you know, but like I said, we could go on for hours about that, but um, but it has things in common with immigration um, and the separation that's occurring right now among families um, with kids in foster care, which are typically um, overwhelmingly um, children of color. Um, so there's oh, some impacts today. Oh, I, the other I'm sorry, but we were gonna, we had foster children in our home. And, uh, you know, DSS has a bad, well, DSS was not helpful in this situation because we felt like the, if, if DSS had focused on helping the mother, then those children could have been reunited with her and they weren't helpful at all. So the children grow up not only resenting us, but resenting their mother and it's just a mess. But you know, these were children of color and they're not interested in helping these families be united. They don't focus on the, the parents and, and reunification for the parents. You know, this is a money thing. I got to get off. I'm, I'm not helping things here. I hope y'all have a good meeting. No, I, I appreciate your contribution, it, and especially because you have the experience of being a foster parent. Um, when I first started as a guardian ad litem, I thought um, that removing children who were being abused or neglected was a solution, not, not the best one, of course, but one solution to the issue. But the longer I worked as a guardian, the longer the more I understood that the impact of separating families was so negative. And um, in the experience of children in foster care being separated from their, uh, not just their parents, but their siblings was so severe that, that I think we're doing it all wrong. I mean, I, I have stopped my work as a guardian and I've had some time to reflect on it and I really think that the way that we approach it is backwards we should be even if we can't keep the kids together with a parent who's having problems parenting we should keep the number one priority should be keeping the siblings together because I will tell you children who are in foster care will go to any lengths to find and connect with family members, siblings, extended family. Um, that, you know, you, it's a mistake to think that they forget where they come from and who they are connected to because they don't. They always remember, and it's a very big issue. Um, is is there anybody in our little group here who's experienced a form of family separation that would like to share their experience? And then, like you say, that's a, an emotional topic, but has anybody had the experience and uh, willing to share what that meant to them? No? I know you have opinions and experiences I really would like to hear from you. I don't want to talk the whole time to myself. Anybody, anybody had a family separation? Anyone? I just have something I'll say. Can okay. you hear me? Yes, thank you. I've never experienced um, child separation. We was very fortunate to be able to um, 
all grow up together as brothers and sisters and, you know, have our family and everything. But from what I'm hearing here, it's just, it's sad, really. And, you know, you see from this point of view, you're kind of seeing where these children in the world that, you know, are growing up to have the problems they have and stuff, you're kind of seeing where it's facing from, which is a very sad thing. Um, th there's another form of separation that is very common, um, which is to have a family member, a father or mother, who's incarcerated. And again, the impact of that falls very heavily on people of color and people who are disadvantaged. So, um, that's another it's another whole issue but it it has similar consequences for families a parent who's incarcerated can't participate in the normal parenting functions and uh, as hard as it is to get siblings together when they're in foster care um, getting children together with a parent who's incarcerated is a, a huge burden for the, the caretaker of the children. Um, oftentimes, uh, parents are incarcerated at a great distance from their families. So getting them together is really difficult. Um, I know I've, I've had some visits with some kids at DSS um, through another volunteer effort, and um, that's a huge thing for them being separated from their families while they're going through um, incarceration. Um, do you think there's any justification for separating children from their families at the border? Is there, is there any good reason to do that? Well, as somebody who I work with that population, with them for about eight years. Um, one of the biggest with border separation is trafficking. So if they can't having a hard time hearing you, if you could get closer to your mic. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> I said as someone who's worked with that population for uh, closely for about eight years now. Um, one of the biggest concerns with border separation is um, trafficking. And so if they can't prove a relational, um, a relationship, whether it's documentation or, um, you know, birth certificates, passports, whatever that may be, if they can't prove a familial relationship, then children are separated. And then later on, what happens is after we contact, I work with the minors. So after we contact border patrol ice and, and we're able to obtain birth certificates then we can reunite upon discharge but that's the biggest concern is trafficking i have a question for you since you you're familiar with the with the situation do you think there's a real concern about trafficking or is trafficking an excuse to separate um there's a real concern, um, you know, I, I, there's, there's been throughout my, my experience, as a matter of fact, there's just recently the Haitian children that were, well, the, the 300 Haitians, we received a couple of those children. Um, and, you know, there's this concern that they come using different names so that they can work their labor trafficking. Um, and so there, there is a tangible concern. Is it 100%? No, but um, I, I, I would hope, I, I, again, I work, on the, I work with the minors, I don't work in border patrol, but I would hope that there's this, that that's in the forefront of separation, that it's not just, um, you know, they separate as an excuse. Um. Talk to us about the children that you've met who are experiencing separation. What are some of the what are some of the issues that they have that we should be concerned about? Well, 
resilience with children is is um, pretty strong. It's pretty, uh, you know, it's amazing how resilient children are. But there is anxiety that's associated a lot with separation. So what happens is we, and I say we in general, expect that children, um, they come, they're coming to be, let's say mom left when she was, when they were five for economic purposes, when the minor was five. Now the minor's 15, hasn't seen mom in 10 years. Yeah, they talk on the phone, but there's no real familial relationship. There's nothing there. There's, you know, distance of thousands of miles. And so he's traveling and we think, oh, you know, he's going to be with mom. This is great. No, he's not. He's going to be with a stranger. And it's anxiety provoking. And they, they come to our shelter and they spend two, three weeks with us. And then they're crying when it's time to go because they don't know now what they're going to expect when they get to mom. And so it's another trauma for them. It's another traumatic event. They lost mom in the beginning. They, they built relationships with caretakers. They are losing those caretakers to go where they have no idea. So that's, um, you deal with a lot of anxiety, some anger, um, but some of them come from conditions that are, we can't even fathom here in the U.S. And so um, for them, it's, it's, they, I guess they kind of understand. And then as they've taken the journey themselves, they see the perils that their parents or their family, whomever that may be, um, have faced. And so they end up developing a sense of empathy as well throughout the process. Um, so you see that too, um, you know, and then you also see a camaraderie uh, that they that they establish um, for those that have taken the journey together. What about um, siblings? Do you have uh, at all or with children who are like small sibling groups, like like a couple of kids together or even more? Yeah, so we, not long ago, around Christmas time, we had a group of um, three brothers, uh, 13, 15, and three. Um, and they got separated from mom at the border. Mom was actually detained on the Mexican side, but they were able to get um, across because they were minors. So they were able to get across. Um, and they ended up going to uh, foster care to a long-term facility with a sister that was, they were separated from later on. She was, she was 17. So it was 17, 15, 13, and three. And they were reunited in a foster facility until mom was able to get the coyotes to bring her across. Um, so it's a caretaking type of, uh, you know, the, 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 one of the bigger things we dealt with as caretakers was um, the, the older sibling tends to be parentified. And so just, you know, kind of telling them you know, and, and you see that even here in, in, in families that, that are broken up as well. The older one kind of takes the younger siblings and is, is in this protective state, but they're parentified. So it's kind of getting them to trust us to, that we're going to care for the younger one. Um, and so that was, that was something that you saw quite a bit. And then there was also some relief once the older one realized that they could get taken, you know, that they can kind of be a kid and let somebody else take care of their three-year-old sibling. Um, you know, we would see sometimes as time went on that they would even want to go into separate bedrooms. They'd be like, can I go with the other kids? And, you know, you could put him in the crib with the little ones. Um, and so you, you kind of see that, but that rapport has to be developed first. Yeah. Yeah, one of, one of the biggest issues I had as a guardian was um, insisting on sibling visits because it's a lot of trouble to arrange those when kids are separated in different foster families. Um, you know, it, it takes time and effort to get them together. And um, there would be resistance to doing that. And so, you know, when I was in, in court, um, I was always interested in having the judge order sibling visits, not just allow them, but order them to make sure that kids got opportunities to see each other. Because in the absence of a parent, um, 
the siblings take on huge importance to kids. They, they really want to know where their siblings are, what they're up to. They want contact. Um, and it, it, the problem is it's so infrequent. If they get once a month, that's a lot. Usually it's less because like I say, it's trouble. It, it takes time for the caseworker to get it done. Um, organizing schedules with all those different families is really hard, but it's so important to do because kids know where they come from. They know who loves them. They know who they are in terms of family relationships and they, they crave so and one of the most basic relationships is you know you go from the parent and then you have the sibling relationship so it's it's when those are damaged or or fractured or estranged then that's kind of the foundation for every other relationship you tend to have yeah. you know so the only way to kind of hold on to who you are is by having those relationships. If you can't have them with mom or dad for either separation or due to imprisonment, death, you know, um, uh, immigration, whatever, then the next best thing is your siblings. You know, that's how you hold on to those memories. That's how you, you know, you keep, you know, grasp of who you are. Well, I, my parents are both gone. My my family relationships now are with my, yes. my brother. Huh? My family. Who was that that was weighing in? I see you guys are muting yourselves again. I really... I, I think she was talking to somebody in the room with her. <laughs> ah, okay. okay. So... <laughs> Sorry about that, you guys. I'm I'm really kind of interested in the, the huge impact. You know, we don't, and I wish our lady that was um, concerned about the slavery issue was still with us. That's huge, and it has created a, a huge impact. You know, generational trauma for people who um, were separated by slavery as has um, Indian child as well. Um, yeah, that's something we, I, you know, have on my notes. I didn't get any articles about that separation, but that was huge. Um, the, the belief that you could train the Indian out of a child, assimilation. removing them from their families and taking them off to boarding schools and destroying their connection to their culture. That, that's a form of, to me, that's a form of genocide. I'm sorry. That's a, a horrible impact. You know, the Pope has apologized, but hey, you know, there were all those years of the Catholic Church. And not just the Catholic Church. There were other churches that did the same thing that established um, schools for indigenous children and took them out of their families. Train them to be white. Thought it was in their best interest, but yeah, I recently attended a, a webinar for um, ICWA, and it talked about if they're like if you Google the before and after picture of Indian boarding school, and you will see the difference of how you know what these boarding schools did to change their appearance. So not only did the boarding schools, but then you come back and like you said, it's generational. And when you look back generationally, you know, it could be somebody that was my grandfather's age that was in boarding school. So it wasn't that long ago when you think about it generationally. I'm just wondering, and this is just throwing it out there. Um, what's What's the motivation to separate families? Why is it done? Is it, is it really an intentional destruction of these families? Or is it done with their best interest 
and heart. Is there is there ever a justification for doing it? I'm just wondering um, because you know the, there was a policy established recently to separate families at the border. To you know, it was done with intention, not just accidentally or oh because it's the law. That was the excuse that was given uh, to separate kids from parents because, oh, the parent is breaking the law by entering the, the country illegally. So um, we need to separate them because the parent is a criminal, essentially. Um, that, you know, that doesn't ring true with me. I think, um, I think that it was done with the intention of discouraging immigrants from coming. Um, and despite the fact that people do enter illegally, um, a, a large number of people are coming to our borders and asking for asylum. They are leaving intolerable conditions and coming here asking uh, for help. And does that make them a criminal? No. They're asking in a legal manner to be admitted because they are living in circumstances that are, are dangerous for them, life-threatening. So um, a policy that says, no, 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 you, if you come here, we're going to take your children, is, um, it's meant to discourage them. It's meant to make it um, more difficult and, and frightening. For them to come and uh, it's fear-mongering yeah exactly and and as a citizen who um, experiences freedom in my country i i i don't like to know that that's done in my name as a, as a citizen of the united states that bothers me a great deal um, And the other issue, of course, the incarcerated parents, um, that is also very destructive of families. Um, I, you know, hopefully we can address that issue as well. Um, but that's, that's an area where I think there's not a lot of sympathy for people. There's probably more sympathy and feeling for immigrants coming in than there is for people who are incarcerated. His bottom line is if you're incarcerated, you've done something illegal. You have contributed to crime in the country. And so you shouldn't get any special consideration because of that. You, you don't deserve family relationships the same way others do. Um, but that's that's also a form of intergenerational trauma. We have, you know, a large number of, of people of color, people from disadvantaged communities who are in prison um, and their family relationships are essentially severed because of the difficulty of staying connected. So that when we release those people from prison, um, they go back to their communities, but they don't have um, the family connection that they had when they went to prison. Imagine that you're in prison for 15, 20 years. When you come out, you, you, uh, you know, a person who's been traveling or been separated by other reasons uh, would normally go back to find their family and reconnect. But people who've been in prison have a huge disadvantage trying to reconnect with family. It's not impossible, but it's incredibly difficult. Um, yeah, that's. I, I don't want to talk the whole time. I find myself. Um, being the only person speaking, I'm sure you have thoughts. So if you if you would not mind sharing them, I'd love to hear them. I'd really like to know. For anybody who hasn't really spoken yet, I'd love to hear from you.
Yeah, that's a good question, Gabrielle. That's a good one. Can everybody see that? She's asking, Gabrielle says, what question would you ask Elizabeth if she were here? And you'll get it in the phone. Let me think, what would I ask her? I, here's something I would wonder about. Um, she's been separated from her father for a very long time. She's at an age when she might expect to marry and have her own children. So what would she want her children to know about her father um, if they were if they were able to be reunited? That's that's a huge thing. You know, having grandparents um, is probably one of the biggest factors in the success of the human race. The fact that um, parents live long enough to help care for the children of the next generation. Um, you know, an anthropologists will tell you that that's part of the reason that humans are so successful is that relationship between the parent of the parent and the, the minor children that, that, that's helped the human race to be um, incredibly successful. Because if you have um, that extra pair of hands, that uh, extra um, care for children, you, you contribute much more to their success. I wasn't fortunate enough to have a real relationship with my grandparents when I was young. Um, you know, I, I don't have those memories of going to grandma's and, and hanging out. But I know that for some people, that relationship, the relationship with grandma, which is so non judgmental and nurturing, is extremely important for kids to feel cared for and loved. And again, if you if you look at foster care, there are um, so many grandparents caring for their children's children. That relationship is incredibly important. I don't I don't know if um, Heather, you're um, a social worker. I'm assuming. I'm a clinician. Clinician. Okay, so you, you work with kids in, in the system. Um, I'm just wondering, how important do you find grandparent relationships for kids that you work with? It's extremely, it's extremely important. As a matter of fact, they tend to be the ones in, in when the family, when it's the parent that has migrated, um, it tends to be the grandparent that is the caregiver in home country. And so they, they take on the parental role. Um, and fortunately, some of the minors end up leaving because the grandparents have either passed now or their health is um, deteriorating to the, fact, to the point that they can't take care of younger children, including teenagers. Um, but that's the whole essence, like that, that, is they, that is their anchor to their culture, to you know their who they are their identity everything is um the grandparent uh you know and it, it's unfortunate though when even again with incarcerated parents and, and caregivers that end up being grandparents is sometimes they're not um you know for socioeconomic reasons sometimes they're not able to care for these young children um, you know, their health and, and whatever else may be going on with them. And so it ends up adding additional trauma and additional strain to um, already aging individuals. So, um, you know, which then is a, another layer of loss for the child. So. One thing that I've seen a little bit, I've, I've not had that many kids who were placed with family members. Um, 
a few, but most of the kids I've worked with have been in foster care. But I, I did have one uh, family where uh, family members took on the care of several children. I think it was three or four kids. Um, and the children were so happy to be placed with family members. They were just ecstatic. And, and the, the care and concern was there, but because um, family placement means the financial supports that are given when kids are in foster care don't exist. Um, they'll get a little bit of support from the state, but it's not enough to cover the actual costs of taking on the care of these kids. And so um, it, it was just really tragic to me. The kids were placed, they were happy, they were with people they knew and were you know, feeling more secure. And then because um, the family just could not afford taking on three or four more children, they had to give them up and then they were separated. So it, it's, you know, that's a re-traumatization of those children. They, they thought they were safe and then they were moved again. And I think that's just really unfortunate that we don't give enough support in family placement for people to be able to afford to help um, take on the, the, the burden of, of raising their relatives' children. So it's, you know, it's not fair, it's not, I, I, I always think it's less helpful to place the kids that way and then yank them out. They would have been better off not to have that false hope that they would fail them. Well, I have something to say. Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Um, I don't think that DSS does nowhere near what they should do to help children that are taken out of a home. Uh, the only experience I really have with this is a friend of mine, and she had left her children at home with the, her cousin, and while she was gone, the police showed up at her house, took her children because the girl that the, her cousin she, she had left her with had a warrant. The police showed up. Well, the girl ran out the back door and left the children in the house by herself, so the police come in, take my friend's kids because the kids are home alone. Okay, so they, this, she goes into this, um, this girl loved her three little girls, okay? And then she goes into this and fights and tries to get the children back and they're putting her through so much and her mind will not even take knowing that her children are gone. She turns to medicine to help her because she cannot stand it. The medicine, eventually she's abusing it because to get by while she's still trying to fight for her children. And eventually it, I mean, eventually after about a year of this, they just put her children up for adoption, even though she's fighting for them. And they got adopted out. And she could, they sent her a letter through the mail, didn't even tell her they were adopting them. They sent her a letter through the mail and said, here's a letter from your children saying goodbye to you. And she had a letter. She had letters from her kids. Bye, mommy. We love you. And all this. But that's the last she heard from them. And to me, that was just, I mean, that scarred me. And it wasn't even my children. I just can't even imagine. They should work with these parents. Help them. You know, tell them. You're not losing them forever if you just keep working with it. You know, we're going to let you have your children back, not sit here and tell them, oh, you can see them once a month for five minutes and your kids are going to be screaming the whole time because they want to go home with you. And then adopt them out. Um, that, well, that's another thing that I, you know, I really want to bring that up. But there, there are... I think we are too fast to um, terminate parental rights in some cases. And you're right, DSS is not doing all that it can to reunify families because um, if we put our focus 
on family preservation. I mean, they, they talk about family preservation and that's a, a, a topic that you know, you'll hear a lot, but really if we wanted to preserve families, we would do a lot more to make that happen. Exactly. One thing I've also learned about um, kids in foster care and, and their parents is that about 80% of the time, I'm not saying there aren't parents who are, are not abusive. There are parents who just do not have the parenting skills to that let them take care of their kids properly. And a lot of times that's because they've grown up in foster care. We have that generational effect. But um, a lot of times the reason that people make bad choices is because the only choices they have are bad ones because of poverty you know poverty is the is the engine that runs the issue uh, when people are poor they don't have middle class options they don't they have a hard time paying for caretakers they have a hard time locating care caretakers that are responsible for their kids um, you know they may have to leave like you said, older siblings in charge of kids so that they can work or, you know, earn money for the family. Um, you know, I have one little family that um, mom left the kids in the motel room so that she could go and work. And the oldest child taking care of the younger siblings was nine years old. That's a terrible choice. Mm -hmm. But she didn't feel she had any other choice. So poverty is a big driver of child neglect and many more children are removed because of neglect than because of abuse I can tell you that from my experience so yeah that's don't get me started yeah <laughs> yeah in the end um DSS broke me I I really would have continued but I just I got to a point where I could not all right but I, yeah so i i put in the time that i could and i wish i had been able to do more but um yeah it, it didn't work yeah well um paula it's eight o'clock yes ma'am i was gonna tell everybody if you'd send me your email address in the chat you can send it to me privately um, I will make sure you get all these art. Cheryl's got several articles that she wanted me to share with you all, but it won't let me put it in the, paste it into the chat here. Can you paste it into the chat, Cheryl? Um, I wasn't able to. You're going to okay. have to email it. Um, if, you, if you do that, then I can make sure I have your email addresses and I'll send them to you. Um, and I want to thank Cheryl for... Um, leading this discussion and i want to thank everybody for participating and being here and um you know inv being involved in this i am now going to end the recording oops stop